welcome to The Code Tray, the podcast of the ACCP Emergency Medicine PRN. I'm your host, Christian Kroll, an emergency medicine and ICU pharmacist at the University of Iowa Hospital and Clinics. To view this recorded presentation, head to our YouTube channel at youtube.com forward slash at ACCP EMEDPRN. And for PRN members, slides can be found under the Libraries Entry section of the ACCP Communities website. Today, we first have Nina Benson, who is a PGY-1 resident at Franciscan Health, Indianapolis. Today, she will be presenting a journal club on predictive value of ionized calcium level for sinus rhythm conversion in adenosine treatment for paroxysmal supraventricular tachycardia. Thank you. First, a question, more of a rhetorical question to think to yourself is, how many times in the ED has a patient come in in SVT or supraventricular tachycardia, and you give them the six milligram dose of adenosine, and it doesn't convert them into normal sinus rhythm? If that's happened to you, I know that happens at our institution plenty of times where sometimes now they just immediately jump to the 12 milligram dose. A study might provide an answer to that question and give us a little more insight on different medications and different choices we can make if a patient seems like they won't have a positive response to the six milligram dose of adenosine. This is a list of abbreviations that I'll utilize throughout the presentation. The most common ones I'll use are SVT for supraventricular tachycardia, and you might see ICA often on the presentation as well for ionized calcium. We'll begin with a little background on what brought the study into place and some primary literature that occurred before this study was conducted. Starting with supraventricular tachycardia, or SVT. So this is a paroxysmal SVT is a rhythm disorder that can lead to heart failure or in some extreme cases can even lead to cardiac arrest. Our first line treatment for SVT includes vagal maneuvers such as blowing in a syringe or holding your breath or cold water, followed by IV adenosine as your other first line choice. Typically started as a six milligram dose followed by a 12 milligram dose that you can repeat. If those methods are ineffective, your second line options are IV calcium channel blockers such as verapamil or dotiazam, and also IV beta blockers are indicated in this second line. Calcium, which we'll talk about a little further on, is a crucial electrolyte for contraction and regulation of the heart muscles, and adenosine does have some impact on calcium as well. The role of adenosine and its relation to calcium, so adenosine directly binds to alpha-1 receptors in the cardiac tissue, activating outward potassium current and inward calcium currents, which then leads to hyperpolarization of the cell. It also indirectly activates inhibitory glycoproteins, which then inhibit the L-type calcium channels and reduce the calcium influx into the cell as well. It reduces the conduction velocity in the atrial myocytes in the SA node by decreasing CAMP and inhibiting the pacemaker current, which overall leads to a slower rate for spontaneous depolarization and should hopefully convert the patient into a normal, normal sinus rhythm and slow down their heart rate. This is a visual of those cardiac adenosine receptors, so you can see the alpha-1 receptors and their effect on the inward potassium channel activation and inward inhibition of calcium channels, which leads to a negative chronotropy and negative dromotropy effect on the heart. The first piece of literature that we'll discuss is actually a case report more pertinent to calcium and its potential role in supraventricular tachycardia. So this was a 63-year-old male who came in with SVT, his past medical history included having hypoparathyroidism, and he was non-compliant to his calcium supplementation. His initial calcium labs, his ionized calcium was 0.76, and his calcium was 5.5. So they tried a lot on this patient. Their initial response was administering IV adenosine 6 milligrams, then a 12 milligram dose. They then attempted IV metoprolol 5 milligram twice, IV dotiazam, and IV amiodarone, and no effect was seen in the patient. Their secondary responses were to administer IV magnesium and administer IV calcium gluconate, and then the patient converted into sinus rhythm in which they then started a calcium infusion. So the discussion from this case report was that parathyroid hormone does regulate calcium, which we know, and in hypoparathyroidism, calcium should be tightly controlled. So the fact that this patient was non-compliant with their calcium supplementation could have potentially put them into SVT, and having low calcium can potentially lead to QT prolongation, leading to arrhythmias, including, in worst cases, torsades. The second piece of literature we'll look into is more looking at our rate of adenosine conversion for SVT and whether a six milligram dose, how often that does actually convert patients into normal sinus rhythm versus the 12 milligram dose. 
So this was a retrospective chart review comparing six milligram versus 12 milligram adenosine initial doses. They included adult patients with hemody hemodynamically stable SVT on an EKG. They excluded pregnant patients, patients taking any other medications that could potentially bias the outcomes or interact with adenosine. If patients received electrical cardioversion, administration of adenosine via central line, or diagnosis of hypervolemia or underlying dysrhythmia. Their primary outcome was rate of SVT termination, and their secondary outcomes reviewed termination of SVT with subsequent adenosine doses and time to ED disposition. For the primary outcome, you can see that the six milligram dose only converted patients or ended their SVT in about half the patients they saw at 56.4%, and the 12 milligram dose achieved SVT termination in 79.1%, and this was statistically significant between groups. The secondary outcomes, 28.2% uh, of patients in the remaining 6 milligram group then converted and they administered a 12 milligram group uh, to the 12 milligram dose versus only 1% converted after subsequent dosing of the 12 milligram group, which was statistically significant as well. However, the ED disposition or time to leaving the ED was similar between the two groups. Our third of four studies reviewed our other dosing options or other medication choices that we might make in SVT looking at our calcium channel blockers. So this was a placebo-controlled double-blind study. Patients were randomized to receive 6 milligrams of adenosine followed by 12 milligrams as needed. And then in other patients, they received verapamil 5 milligrams followed by 7.5 milligrams. The study included adult patients with spontaneous or induced episode of SVT and the arrhythmia had to be sustained for at least five minutes. Excluded patients with CHF, unstable angina, recent MI, severe valvular regurgitation, intracardiac shunts, or sleep apnea, or if they received those other medications that could potentially skew the outcomes of just looking at adenosine or verb. The primary outcome here was conversion to sinus rhythm. From the results, you can see the adenosine conversion was pretty similar to the study we just looked at with a 6 milligram dose converting about half the patients, the 12 milligram dose converting 93% of patients. For verapamil, you can see their initial dose at 5 milligrams converted 81.3% of patients, and the 7.5 dose converted 91.4% of patients. So potentially having an increased conversion rate compared to the first dose of adenosine at 6 milligrams. From an adverse effect standpoint, both were associated with facial flushing. However, this was more common in the adenosine group, and one instance of severe hypotension occurred in the verapamil group. The study did not explicitly define what severe hypotension was, but we know with calcium channel blockers, hypotension is one of the major adverse effects we would be worried about or concerned when administering an IV dose of them. The final study includes dotizam with verapamil just to kind of wrap up both of our calcium channel blocking agents that we might utilize. So this was a review of seven trials comparing adenosine versus calcium channel agonists, verapamil or dotizam, included any patients with SVT within 24 hours, and their composite outcome was reversion to sinus rhythm or any major adverse effects. The primary outcomes, the odds of reversion was 89.7 with adenosine, which is far more increased than the other studies we just discussed versus 92.9% with calcium channel agonist. But you can still, still see here the calcium channel agonist did have higher rates of conversion. One trial, again, noted to confirm what the previous study we discussed, that hypotension was a major adverse effect with the calcium channel agonist. So could be something you'd want to consider before giving to a patient if they are at risk of going hypotensive. That wraps up our previous literature and background discussion before we dive into the study at hand and looking at um, the outcomes of this study. So this is predictive value of ionized calcium levels for sinus rhythm conversion and adenosine treatment for paroxysmal supraventricular tachycardia. The design of this study, it was conducted at a retro or it was a retrospective study at a single center university affiliated training hospital emergency department and it was conducted between December of 2019 through December of 2023. And their objective of this study was to evaluate the relationship between ionized calcium levels and achievement of normal sinus rhythm after a six milligram dose of adenosine. Looking at our patient population, they included adult patients who were diagnosed by SVT by two emergency physicians, and if they received IV adenosine for conversion to sinus rhythm, conversion of sinus rhythm. They excluded any patients that did not have complete medical records available, the absence of SVT on an EKG, 
if the SVT was successfully terminated by vagal maneuvers, patients who received other antiarrhythmics after the first or second dose of adenosine, if patients were managed by EMS in the field, patients that were hemodynamically unstable, prior IV administration of antiarrhythmics, prior radiofrequency catheter ablation, and patients with a wide complex tachycardia. The treatment protocol was first line, patients attempted vagal maneuvers to terminate the SVT. Second line, they received IV adenosine at a six milligram dose with a second 12 milligram dose if no response was seen within the first minute. And third line, an additional 18 milligram dose was considered and given to some patients as well. How adenosine was administered, it was through an IV catheter in the right cubital vein or the most proximal vein near the heart. And it was administered using a stopcock at a rate of one to two seconds, followed by a rapid bolus flush of normal saline, which is pretty standard practice as well. The primary outcome measure was association between ionized calcium levels and conversion to normal sinus rhythm following adenosine administration in patients with SVT. The statistical analysis they performed, they used continuous variables were evaluated using a student's t-test and expressed as a mean and standard deviation and median values. Categorical variables were presented as percentages. Normality was assessed with a KS test, and a p-value of less than 0.05 was considered statistically significant, which seems appropriate based on the objective and the values that they were evaluating. The patient cohort that they evaluated, so 460 patients with SVT were evaluated here. 326 patients were included, which was broken into 251 patients being responsive to adenosine at any dose and 75 patients being non-responsive to adenosine. 134 patients were excluded from this. The major reason for exclusion was absence of ionized calcium measurements. Given this was a retrospective study, some labs were not available. Prior antiarrhythmic drug use. SVT that was terminated using vagal maneuvers, no EKG records, insufficient data, and then wide QRS segment and unstable clinical condition as well. Looking at our baseline characteristics, um, most of the patients here were around 50 years of age. 60% of them were male. The median heart rate was 181 beats per minute. And their a history, having a history of past paroxysmal SVT was prevalent in about 60% of patients. History of beta blocker use was in a third of patients, and the baseline calcium was 9.73, which was a corrected calcium, with a normal calcium level being between 8.3 to 10.6, and the baseline ionized calcium was 1.07, with your normal ionized calcium level being about 1.15 to 1.32. Looking at the adenosine dose and response, so having a positive response to the 6 milligram dose occurred in about 37.4% of patients, which is much lower than those previous studies that we reviewed in our background section. Having a positive response to the 12 milligram dose occurred in about 68.3% of patients. And with the 18 milligram positive response, this was in about 12.5% of patients. So the overall responsiveness to any adenosine dose that was given was 76.9%, which Seems a little bit lower, probably about 10% lower than those previous studies that we reviewed for the overall responsive rate to adenosine. From the ionized calcium level analysis, you can see with the 6 milligram dose, when they broke it into the responsive and the non-responsive, their ionized calcium levels were different, with the responsive being about 1.13, so just slightly out of range, and the non-responsive group being at 1.03, which was statistically significant and showed a difference between these groups. However, with the 12 milligram group and the 18 milligram group, you can see that their ionized calcium levels were all within 0.1 of each other, and this did not have a statistically significant difference between the two groups based on their ionized calcium level. The cutoff for ionized calcium was determined to be about 1.14, with an ionized calcium level above 1.14, predicting sinus rhythm restoration with a sensitivity of 64.75% and a specificity of 87.75%. So the result conclusions were with a higher ionized calcium level greater than that 1.4 may predict res positive response to a 6 milligram adenosine dose in SVT. And on the other hand, having a lower ionized calcium level or less than the 1.14 may predict that they will not have a positive response to the 6 milligram adenosine dose and may not convert with that small dose. Discussing the strengths and limitations, the strengths in this study are they did encompass a protocol in place, starting with the vagal maneuvers and working their way up through the dose's strengths. It was a large study size, greater than 300 patients were reviewed. 
and experienced emergency medicine specialists were evaluating these patients. The limitations was it was a retrospective single center design, which can lead to some deviation from the protocol in some patients. Some patients might have been excluded given they did not follow this protocol when if it was prospective study, perhaps they would have been able to be included and evaluated. Adenosine-related side effects were not collected within this study. And then with that increased 8 milligram, 18 milligram dose, it would have been interesting to see any side effects there. SVT was diagnosed by an EKG and not a true EP study, which is pretty standard. I feel like we only use EKGs to evaluate SVT, but this was a limitation that the study authors noted themselves. And they did not have a defined, si defined sinus rhythm time. So it's kind of undetermined how long patients were truly in normal sinus rhythm after they converted with the adenosine versus how little they might have been, how, how little time they might have actually fallen back into SVT after the adenosine dose. So the overall impact on practice, this could help identify patients in SVT who could be unresponsive to adenosine at that 6 milligram dose. It may encourage providers to use the increased 12 milligram dose instead of the 6 milligram dose. It could also predict patients that could benefit from those alternative antiarrhythmic therapies, such as calcium channel blockers or beta blockers. It could limit incidences of treatment failure and associated adverse effects which co coincides with improving overall patient care, having to receive less medication and solving the problem quicker using those other agents or an increased dose if it were to be needed. And with that, I'd like to open it to any questions or discussion about the journal. If you have enjoyed this presentation content and would like to hear more, subscribe via your favorite podcasting app. Additionally, make sure to check out our YouTube page for all recorded presentations. Thank you for listening to this week's ACCP Emergency Medicine Journal Club Presentation. Join us weekly for review and discussion of new journal articles in emergency medicine. This podcast provides general information only and does not offer individualized medical or professional health care services, including pharmaceutical advice. The contents and materials in the podcast are not intended to be a substitute for inpatient pharmaceutical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. And the use of the contents and materials in the podcast does not constitute a pharmacist-patient relationship. As a result, the information in and materials linked to this podcast are applied at the user or patient's own risk. Users or patients should consult their physician or personal health care professional. The user or patient should not ignore or delay seeking care because of something they heard on this podcast. In case of an emergency, the user or patient should contact their physician, call 911, or go to the nearest medical emergency facility. The views and statements expressed on this podcast are those of the host and guest and should not be interpreted to reflect the official position or policy of ACCP or the Emergency Medicine PRN.